Welcome to the Jesus Movement, uh, to everyone who's joining us now online. We've just completed our, our worship component of our service. Um, this uh, sermon is the beginning of a new sermon series. And this new sermon series, as it says uh, on the screen behind us, it's called Running the Race. And this week's uh, first sermon is called Setting the Actual Path. And so we're having a look and focusing on Hebrews 12 and the metaphor that uh, verse 1 presents to us. So I'm going to open up today with a, a scripture from Philippians. And it's always really interesting to me and touches me when we take communion and the communion message comes up with the same scripture as we're about to open our uh, sermon with today. And so this uh, message uh, today, this comes from Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, and it reads, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves. So again, that's from Philippians chapter 2 verse 3. So it's time to, for everyone to run the race of faith, and not just to run it, but to actually win. In an age when it's easy to quit, God anticipates his children will pace themselves and finish. Like the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7, I would like to say, when I draw my final breath, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. So again, that's from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. So if anyone had a reason to quit, it was the Apostle Paul. For those of you who know a bit about his story, he had a particularly tough time uh, once he became an apostle. He used to be a persecutor of Christians, and then when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, of course, his life changed, and he became one of those who now went out and became persecuted by others. So his journey preaching the gospel was adventurous, to say the least, and it was actually full of hardships. And so I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 to 29. It's a long scripture, and so only a portion is actually up on the screen. So I'd just like to encourage you that you have your Bibles with you, and that as we go through these scriptures, that you open your Bibles to follow along. So 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 22 to 29 reads, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labours more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches? Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? I find it astonishing how the Apostle Paul persevered against such perils. You can see from this scripture, it was extraordinary. We often moan and complain about those things that come against us, but this list of Paul's from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22 to 29, is extraordinary. He's got lists of perils, even including three times being shipwrecked which I don't think people would have happened in their lives very often. But thankfully God gave him, as he does for each of us, a way of escape. There is help and deliverance for each of us who calls on his name, 
And then Paul recounts one such escape again in 2 Corinthians, this time in chapter 11, verses 32 to 33. So 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 32 to 33. So continuing on from where we were. It reads, If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor, under Aretas the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Paul escaped to do what? To run his race. With every escape and gift of overcoming we are blessed with, we too should be encouraged to finish the race of faith. When we read these scriptures about Paul, he would have a lot of good excuses to give up, and, but he didn't. And when he got le- led, sorry, uh, lifted into the basket and lowered out of the window in Damascus, he didn't see that as a great escape. He saw that as an opportunity to go again. And so his attitude was very different to many other people. So only after you cross the finish line will you actually win. So this is a lifelong journey. You will see blessings, favour and new beginnings. And in Revelation 21.5 it says, Behold, I make all things new. So your life's race will be problematic. You will have hindrances and you will have obstacles And it's not until we go to be with the Lord that all things will be made new. So having things coming against us is not a reason for us to actually give up. As Paul's example gives us, it's actually a reason to go again. And so this is where our attitude becomes everything. So today I just want to say, may God keep you, may God protect you and bless you as you run your race of faith in the name of Jesus. God our Saviour. God has a plan for each and every one of you, but it requires perseverance, effort and faithfulness. This series, which is called Running the Race, I'm going to be looking specifically at Hebrews 12, which opens with a metaphor describing our journey through life as a race. Like all races, you can choose to run it well, or you can choose to make little or no effort. To win a race, you can understand the dedication an athlete must make to arrive at the start line. The training, the dedication, abstaining from those things that will hinder their performance, and then when the race begins, it will require effort, perseverance and faithfulness, the belief that the journey is worth the prize at the end. So let's go to the scripture for which this series is based on, and we find it in Hebrews Chapter 12, verse 1. So again, that's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance, that is, patience, the race marked out for us. In today's sermon called Setting the Path, this scripture brings before you the position of the runner who is surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and who has prepared by throwing off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You are carried a stage further in the metaphor when you picture runners standing ready, stripped and straining at the starting post prepared to run with perseverance the race marked out for them, with a long course stretching out into the distance. And so this metaphor gives us this picture. You know, at the beginning of a race, we can watch it on the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games, we can enter a marathon, we can do all sorts of races, even at school, and we have a cloud of witnesses. We have those who are watching the actual race. And then there's us, who you're the person participating in the race, You've done all your training and preparation 
and there you are on the starting line ready to go. But the understanding is if we're going to run a race is that we actually have a journey ahead of us and that it's not going to be something that's instant but something that we're going to actually endure across a distance of time. So my first question today is what does this metaphor convey? What does it convey to you? So we've got this cloud of witnesses and they're saying to throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. What does that metaphor convey to you? Any Don't thoughts? Give Don't, give Don't give up. up. Yeah. God is with us. God is with us. Yes. Any yeah. other thoughts? It's, it's not about winning, but yeah. participating. Right. It's not about winning, but it's about yeah. participating. Because in every race, we have a number of participants, don't we? We don't just have one person. And so part of racing is actually pitting ourselves against other people. And there can only, in a normal race, can only be one winner. But the journey is about the participation and how we do it along the way. Any other thoughts? No? So, the answer that I've written here is that this metaphor conveys an ever-changing, continuous, progressive life that tends towards an end underscored with the need for effort. A traveller can amble along at their leisure. They may fling themselves down under a tree if they get tired. They may diverge from the road should they choose, but a runner can only look ahead and must not be afraid of dust and sweat and they must expect to tax their muscles and lungs to the utmost if they are to reach the goal and win the prize. And so we set this picture in our mind of what it looks like to put effort into winning a running race. So I'm going to put on a slide which will give us three strategies for a successful race. And so the first strategy here is to throw off hindrance and sin. Hindrance and sin is going to be things that you're going to have to deal with. I'm going to continue and break these down in more detail. So this is just the headings for it. The second is to run with perseverance. And the third is to run the race that God has marked out for you. And that's significant, that God has marked out for you. Sometimes we find ourselves running a race which is actually not ours. We're trying to run somebody else's race. And so God has to actually be in this. Okay, so each of these headings will come up again as I progress through each of these stages. So looking, so looking at the first of the three, throw off hindrance and sin, the metaphor tells us to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So in other words, to run well, you have to run light. So my question to you is explain what you see as the difference between sin and hindrance. We have spoken about this on occasions. What do you see as the difference between sin and hindrance? We're making it clear that they're not the same thing. Can you take this? Well... Hindrance is something sort of gets in your TV or sort of external things. Sin is when you, um, I don't know, it's an action thing, so it's, you know, you're actually doing something there. Right. So, so hindrances are something external? Yeah. And sin is something that's, that's it, internal. internal? Of course, yes. Right. Any other thoughts? All quiet today? <laughs> okay. Sin is a transgression of God's laws. Living in a way that is not pleasing to God. Whereas hindrance is something that can come against you, but not necessarily something that breaks God's laws. 
things can stop you in life or come against you in life that don't actually break any of God's rules. Significantly, sin is universal and applies to all mankind, whereas hindrance may affect you but not other. So hindrances can be these things. Having driving your car down the highway and having your car break down can be a hindrance. It's going to affect you getting to where you're going and how you're going to get there. But it's not a sin that your car broke down, is it? Right? Where if someone intentionally ran you off the road with the intent to murder you, we would call that a sin. It's more than a hindrance. Somebody's trying to kill you. So there is a difference between the two. So my next question is to give an example of a hindrance that may affect your race that is not a sin. I just gave you one. Any other thoughts? What's a hindrance that may affect your race that is not a sin? Anything that's someone, come across someone, your own life? Just somebody being difficult towards yeah. you. Right. Someone being difficult towards you is a great example. Yeah. Anything else? Everyone's relaxing today. <laughs> okay. Well, problems, problems come every day of right. that type of obstacles where, mm. um, you know, it could be someone like Telstra, right. you know, dealing with um, some technology or something. Uh, you can choose whether to be angry about it or choose whether to get through it. It's right. not a sin. Right, You're not absolutely. Into a sin. Right, so a problem with the phone company, uh, having a problem with your telephone, is going to be a hindrance, absolutely. And it can overwhelm us. us. Right. And take us down if we let it. That's it. No, no. Come no, no. here. So there's there's many answers to this, but the hindrance that has the great greatest impact on our journey, as Teresa has actually just alluded to, is actually relationships. Right? It's the biggest hindrance to our journey. See, we can make those we love most, we can even make them our idols. We can idolise another person. Not because we love them too much, but because we love them apart from God. Right? So when we love another person, we have a difference between godly love and ungodly love. So instead of drawing lessons of God's infinite goodness from those that are dear to us, so in other words, husbands, wives, children, parents and friends, we draw those things from them that cause us to hang back from God and forget that his love is the best. His heart is the deepest and his sufficiency our safest to trust. Every blessing, gladness and possession external to us, which we mentioned earlier, and every faculty and attribute within us, we can turn into a hindrance that drags us down and separates us from God. And so things that give us a great deal of pleasure can often separate us from God. Right? Because we put our focus into those things, but we forget about God. So in other words, instead of seeking God first in all things we do, we actually seek God down the line somewhere. Because we're having a good time with those earthly pleasures that are in front of us. So to run well, as we said before, we must run light. To run light, we must lay both sin and hindrances aside. The course of our life is a fight because we carry a dual nature. That of the flesh, on the one hand, and that of the spirit, on the other hand. The flesh lusts after, against the spirit, I beg your pardon, and the spirit is against the flesh. So in other words, these two things that we have in our life are actually contrary to each other. And so it becomes a challenge for us to walk and run our race every day. Because of this conflict, we must cast away anything that interferes with it. So let's make an example. If there's something that's a desire that we have that is greater than our desire for God, then we need to get rid of it. It doesn't mean that we can't have nice things. If your TV is something that you enjoy, great. 
But if it takes over your life and you don't do anything else, it's probably a good idea to get rid of it. Right? So we need to weigh up those things in our life and decide, you know, have we always got an excuse not to spend time with God as our business, is our personal life, is our relationships, is our sports, is our hobbies, is our education more important than God? Or is it something that we do as part of our life, but it's still not as important as God? And so we have to get this balance right in our life. Okay, so the second one we're going to have a look at is to run with perseverance, as this scripture tells us. So perseverance, as I mentioned earlier, is another way of saying patience. And patience is a what? Virtue. A virtue? That's the common saying, but what is it in biblical terms? Patience is a fruit. fruit of the Spirit. That's right. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Who gives us the fruits of the Spirit? God gives them to us. They're God given. Okay? So to have patience is a God given virtue, as was just mentioned. So to run well, we must run light, and to run light, we need to cast off the works of the flesh and strap on the fruits of the Spirit. So let's have a look at what the Apostle Paul said about this in his letter to the Galatians. So we're going to go to the Scripture, uh, chapter 5, verses 7 to 9, and what the Apostle Paul said. So again, Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. And it reads, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. So sin and hindrance may be perceived to be insignificant, but like yeast, it spreads and infects. So, Everybody's seen yeast, it's like a little tiny grain, very, very small. And if we put it amongst dough, flour and water, what does it cause it to do? It actually grows. And so yeast in dough is like an infection will cause a growth in the wrong way. And so to find out what yeast can look like, we're going to go to Galatians again, chapter 5, but this time to verses 19 to 21. And verses 19 to 21 talks about the acts of the sinful nature. It says that they are obvious. Things such as sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. It's a pretty horrific list. So now let's have a look at what the dough, the fruit of life looks like. And for this we're going to go to Galatians chapter 5 again, but this time verses 22 to 23. And the fruit of the Spirit is obviously completely opposite. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so we see a completely different picture when we look at the fruits. So my question to you is, how do you see this concept of yeast working through the whole batch of dough? So what do we call the whole batch of dough? The whole batch of dough is your life. life. When we add the yeast to it and what it does to the batch of dough, that is your journey, your race. So what do we have in our dough? Do we have yeast infecting it or do we have fruits of the spirit controlling it? Remember, the flesh is opposed to the spirit. They are in conflict with one another. And so we have to understand this. So again, there's many answers to this question. Whilst hindrances may come against us that we cannot control, in order to run light and stay the course, we need to look to Christ to practice the fruits of the Spirit that we can control. 
The yeast represents, as I said, the works of the flesh that infects the dough, which is like, so which is the fruit of the spirit in your life. So as Christians, you are blessed, for you are actually told what fruit the Spirit leads. How do you think it would be for those who actually don't even consider these things? People don't worry about the fruits of the Spirit. They're not even interested in them. What does their life look like? Right? It's yeast infecting dough. So as Christians, we're blessed because God's Word tells us what will make a difference. By being told the works of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit, you are clearly told what to avoid and what to oppose, and what to cherish and what to cultivate. By this means you are able to overcome it, but this will require perseverance. So we're going to read now from Romans chapter 8, verses 5 to 6. So again, Romans chapter 8. Verses 5 to 6. And it says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. And so we see here that it's one or the other. There's no mixing of the two. You can't add yeast to dough and stop it from having an impact. And so we need to understand that those are living according to sinful nature have minds set on sinful desires. Those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Okay, so we're going to go to the third of the three. And the third one was to run the race God has marked out for us. So again, to run the race that God has marked out for us. So before you can run your race that God has marked out for you, how can you know where it is taking you? What scripture answers this question? We've been teaching on this for quite a while. Before you can run your race that God has marked out for you, how can you know where it is taking you? Any takers? What scripture? From Hebrews, what do we need to have? What do we need to have to do something Faith. that's not Faith. yet seen? Faith. Faith. It's the things hoped for and not seen. Right. So we're talking about Hebrews 11, mm -hmm. chapter 1. And it reads, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Who would run a race if they believed there was no end? Would you enter a race with no end? It doesn't seem any much point, does it? And so, in order to run a race, or to do anything in life, we have to believe that there's an outcome, there's a point at the other end at which we actually arrive. So when we read the Bible, we can know by faith that the universe was formed at God's command. Who went before us? and that the lives led had a purpose in God's plan. Hebrews 11 is often called the Hall of Faith. So if you read through chapter 11, it says by faith, by faith, by faith, and it goes through all of the past greats in the Bible and lists what they actually did by faith. It commends the ancients for their faith, and yet it says, and we're going to go to another scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, this is verse 39 to 40. And it says in this scripture, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. 
What do you think this is talking about? They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. We have been speaking about this in the previous weeks. It doesn't matter if you get what you, what you want. You just keep going. You, you may not get what you want, but you've got to keep going until you die. Yeah. Any other thoughts? We're talking about the past patriarchs, for example. Noah. Oh, let's do the blessings. Yeah. Sorry? The blessings. The blessings. They're still in the ground. Right. Mm. They haven't gone into eternal life. Right. They didn't receive eternal life. Right. There's something we're going to come to with that. Thank you. What we're also talking about, though, is that Abraham was called out by God to make a people unto God. Abraham was promised many, many things of which he saw none. <coughs> what was he promised? He was promised the land of Canaan. He didn't inherit it when he was alive. He was promised descendants that were so many they would be like the stars in the sky and the sands on the beaches. But he didn't see them either. Did it stop him from doing what God called him to do? Mm. No. He aligned himself with God's will and he aligned himself with God's promise even though he didn't receive it. What about Noah? Let's just pick a couple of examples. Noah was called out to build an ark. Spent a hundred years being abused for it. Right? The earth was flooded. When he came back out of the boat, what was he told would happen? That they were told to go out and to multiply and that his descendants would cover the earth. Did he see that? No. no. And so it goes. We can keep going through different people in the Bible. And there was many promises that were actually made to them. And by faith they actually did what God asked them to do. But they didn't actually get to see the fulfilment of it in their own lives. So my question is, how would you go? If you, God said, look, I want you to do this, and yet you're going to pass away without seeing the fruit of doing it, how would you go? It's pretty challenging, isn't it? We're often called to do things as part of God's plan, but God's plan is often bigger than one generation or one person, and yet we have a role to play in it. So we have to be obedient to his will, and be faithful servants of God in order to do this. And so we find here that this is the case. But this scripture tells you that the ancients who came before Christ, which is what was just mentioned a short while ago, were unable to receive the full promise of God's plan. Whereas you have been blessed because God's plan gives you a way to have a relationship with him through his son. Although you can know from this that you are running the race God planned for you, how can you know what God has marked out for you? Here I'm going to give you eight different ways for you to know what God has marked out for you. So I'm just going to pop up this slide with these eight different ways and then we're going to run through each of these. So the first one is to walk with God. The second one is to surrender your will to God. The third one is to obey what you already know to be God's will. And again, these titles will come up as we progress through them. The fourth one is to seek godly input into your life. Pay attention to how God has gifted you. Listen to God's spirit. Listen to your heart. And take notice of your circumstances. Okay? You notice that there's God and there's you all the way through this. It's about relationship with God. And so this is all interconnected in our race in life. And so we'll go to the first one, which as I said is titled To Walk With God. So I'm going to read a scripture with this. And the scripture is from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. And it reads, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. So when we develop a relationship with God, you must seek to know him rather than just to seek to know about him. So up on here, I've put a knowledge point for each of these. These are the things that you need to take away. You must seek to know him rather than just seek to know about him. That requires us to enter into a personal relationship. OK? 
Okay, this is significant. We can study and we can learn, but to enter into a relationship is another level altogether. And so this is part of what you must do on your race. How can we do this? This can be done by this. This can be done by spending time in the Word, by spending time in prayer, and being involved in church and church groups, such as life groups, for example. So we have this opportunity, we are given God's word to actually share. Okay, point number two. Surrender your will to God. Again, number two, surrender your will to God. So we're going to go to a scripture from, from Romans for this one. It's going to be Romans 12, chapter, uh, sorry, Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. And it reads, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this will, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's a fairly well-known scripture. But often when seeking God's will, you may actually be looking for God to rubber stamp what you want to do. It's a common issue. This is not an effective way to find God's true will. I always speak about an example of people we knew a few years ago at church who sat outside after the service and said, I've given up my job. Oh, okay, well, why did you do that? Well, we're just waiting upon the Lord. Well, good luck with that. Because you haven't actually listened to God, you haven't aligned with God's will, and you're not walking with God's promise. That is your will. Do you think that by doing something like that, that God's going to actually bless that? That's not what it's about. So we need to make sure that we're not making our own choices and asking God just to rubber stamp what we want to do. This is not an effective way, as I said, to find God's true will. Before God will reveal his will to you, you have to commit to doing what he desires you to do. Jesus was willing to die for you, so shouldn't you be willing to live for him? And so there's a knowledge point I've put up there again, and it says when you truly surrender to God, that is when he will begin to direct your steps. So, we have this issue with the Bible. God's will is contained in the Bible. He tells you whom he is and what he desires. He tells you how to live. There are 613 commandments in here. So, if you're not prepared to align yourself with God's will then why would you expect him to direct your steps? And so we have a duty to be people who seek God's will first, and we can find out what that is with all of our questions through God's word. So if you're not doing that, this is something that you need to change and to do. Okay. So the next point, point number three, is to obey what you know to be God's will. Again, obey what you already know to be God's will. Many people seem to know what God's plan is for their lives, but overlook that his will is found in their Bibles, as I just mentioned, the word of God. So put simply, if you do not obey that which is revealed to you, how do you expect God to reveal anything further? So here, the knowledge point is that obedience is the important first step. So when you are running your race, when you go into any race, before you can actually start, you have to be obedient to the race organiser 
and fulfill certain requirements. You might have to fill out an insurance disclaimer. You may have to pay fees to start the race. You may have to apply a number to your shirt to say who, who you are to be identified by the race organisers. There's things that you're obliged to do. If you don't want to do it, then you're not going to be able to enter the race. And so for God, the first thing we're called to do is to be obedient to Him. If you're unwilling to be obedient to God, to God's words and to God's laws, then you're not going to get very far on your race. And so this is something that we have to take seriously in our lives. Okay, point four. Point four was to seek godly input. So again, seek godly input. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14, it says, Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counsellors, there is safety. So it's important to seek the counsel of godly advisors or mentors in your life, which I've put up there as the knowledge point. So if you're not sure about something, or perhaps you've read God's word and you need some clarity on what it means, then we're told to go and seek godly counsel from others. If you surround yourself with people who are far from God, your hope of finding His will in your life will be greatly diminished. This is where the church can help you tremendously because being amongst a community of believers will help you to discern God's will. Remember that the church means those people who are set apart, in other words, they've put their lives aside for God. Community of believers. So if we need godly counsel, we need to go to those who are walking with the Lord. Okay? Very important part of your race. In the same way, if you're running a race, if you're an athlete, and you need to improve your performance, what do you do? Do you go to a non-athlete to get advice? Do we go down to the pub and have a beer before the race because it'll relax your nerves? Probably not. Right? We need to go to those who have run races before who know how to win a race and receive wise counsel from them in the same way that we do with the Lord. Okay, number five. Number five was to pay attention to how God has gifted you. And this is really, they're all important, but this is really important. And this is something where many of us fail in life. Paying attention to how God has gifted you. The scripture for this one is from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. And it says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The knowledge point that goes with this is that God's plan for you will always be directly related to the gift or gifts he has bestowed upon you. Does that resonate with anyone? God gives you gifts. And so if you want to know where you should be directing your steps, you should be directing them in the direction of the gifts that God has given to you. Oftentimes in life we can have many skills and many talents and it can be very confusing as to how do we run our race? What's for us? But God actually gives you gifts. So for some, they may be given the gift of music, for example, singing, right? worship. For others, they may be given the gift of teaching. These are just examples. There's literally thousands upon thousands of gifts in terms of our talents that God can actually give us. How do you identify, if I was to ask you now, how, do you, how would you identify what God's gift is to you? Gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit? What about your gift? Not the Spirit's gifts given to you, but what's your gift? Well, you how could, would you identify you, it? You could be good at it, and other right. people could tell you. You enjoy it. You enjoy, enjoy it? it. 
good at it. You can feel at peace, comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really important, isn't it? Because it's basically telling you that the things that you actually are good at and that you enjoy doing, these are what God's planning is for you. So how many people actually work or make their life's purpose about what God's actually gifted you with? This is His plan for you, not your plan for you. We get very confused in life sometimes because we go on this journey and we might be good at doing things, but they don't satisfy us. They don't make us happy. Right? They don't give us joy. They don't give us peace. We do it because we have to earn a living or whatever it might be. And yet God tells us that he's giving you a gift. God created you with a specific role in this world that he only purposed you to do. Do you believe it? Do you believe that God purposed you with a specific role in life? The millions of people upon this planet and God has gifted each and every purpose person with a purpose in their life that comes from him. And so we have to actually receive this. We have to actually believe that this is the case. How amazing is this? So what I'm going to say today is to pay attention to how God has gifted you. If you haven't, think about it, pray about it, talk about it, receive counsel about it. Because whatever number of days you still have in front of you is your race in life. You may have had a difficult time up to now and you can give up. But the reality is, is that every day is a new day and you can change direction. His plan for you will always, as I said, be directly related to the gifts that he has bestowed upon you. That way you will automatically be good at what he has called you to do. You will automatically be good at what he has called you to do. And that's what's going to bring you joy and peace and happiness in your life. And it's going to fulfill you because it's what God's purpose is for you. Okay, so number six. Listen to God's Spirit. Was number six. Listen to God's Spirit. The scripture for this one is from John chapter 10. Verse 27. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The knowledge point that I put up here might sound a bit crass, but learn to shut up when you pray. Oftentimes when we're praying, we're talking at God. We're telling them what we want, what we need, all the rest of it, but we're not actually listening to what God has to say to you. There's a quietness and a stillness that you have to enter into in prayer. So this may sound odd to you, but when you do, when do you take the time to listen? A practical application of this is to make notes, for example, on what you want to pray about. Take the time before you pray to think about what do you actually need to pray about. Questions like, what is the next step in my career? What is the next step in my ministry? What is the next step for my family? What is the next step for my marriage? And so on, we can keep going. But we're already here today now. The past has already passed and we're in the present. So we're gonna pray for something that hasn't yet happened, as we talk about in Hebrews 11.1, then we need to know what it is that we're going to ask the Lord for. We're not asking Him to do it for us, we're asking Him what the next step is. What do I need to do next? Not what do I sit down and wait for God to do for me. God will bless me by being with me in everything that I do. But it's I that have to do it. But it's also my responsibility to align myself with God's will and God's plan for me. So if you meditate on these sort of questions during prayer, often God will begin to flood your heart with ideas and information. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and write down what he speaks into your heart. Be expectant. Ask God for what you need to know. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24, it tells us, Therefore I tell you, 
Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And the knowledge point that goes with that is to be expectant. Ask God for what you need to know. No point asking a question if you already know the answer. If you don't know the answer, this is where we pray to God. We ask Him what you need to do next. But then you have to enter into a time of stillness and meditation. Okay? We have to take the time to actually listen to what God says. When you're praying, who has a journal when they pray? Okay. Okay. So in other words, if God's speaking to you and you don't bother to write it down, and we go a few days later, we might go, oh, what was that God said again? It's pretty important. We should actually take note of what we're actually doing. So a good habit is that when you take your time for prayer with the Lord, is to actually take a journal with you before you go to prayer, is to write down those things that you need to ask the Lord. And then it's to have that quiet time with Him and to actually listen. And as, we, as we're saying today, the Holy Spirit will touch your heart and start to give you thoughts and ideas on where you need to go with this. These are the things that you should be writing down and this is when you act in your faith and you actually go forwards with these. Things that are yet unseen. But you've had the Lord speak to you and tell you what they are. Okay, the next one. Second last one. Number seven, listen to your heart. So we've talked about listening to God's Spirit. Now we're talking about listening to your heart. In Psalms chapter 37, verse 4 to 5, it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. The knowledge point for this one. When you walk with the Lord, he will begin to shape your desires, so that you begin to desire the things he has already called you to do. So again, begin to desire the things he has already called you to do. So what's that telling you? He has a call on your life and a faith for your life before you're aware of it. He's called you to do these things, but if you're not going to listen, you're not going to know what they actually are. When you listen to what God tells you, it should transform your life and it should direct your steps. Being here before you today, after 20 odd years, is the result of listening to God and praying to Him and saying, God, what do you want me to do? What's my purpose in life? What do you want me to do for you? And so that journey, that race, brings me here before you today. I listened to what He said, and I spent 20 years studying God's Word in order that I could teach it to others. And so that's what we call obedience, and that's what we call perseverance, and that's what we call patience. Because God calls you into something, it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. You actually have to put the effort in. But God will tell you what's going to bear fruit. And if you do what He says, it will bear fruit. If you do what you want to do, you may have a good time doing it, but will it bear fruit? Maybe it will give you some joy in life, maybe it will give you some financial success. But will it bear fruit in God's plan for your life and your purpose for Him? So when you walk with the Lord, as I said, He will begin to shape your desires so that you begin to desire the things He has already called you to do. His plan will become your adventure. We just did a series on Nehemiah, talking about faith. Well, that was an adventure. Here he is, the cupbearer of the Persian king Artaxerxes. He responds to God's will. He aligns himself and he leaves Susa in today's Iran, southern Iran, and goes to Jerusalem to build the walls of Jerusalem. That's an adventure. He's got people coming against him all the way there, and he's got people coming against him while he is there. Well, that's an adventure. Right? Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but God was directing his steps, and he was running his race in alignment with God's will. It's a good example. Okay, so point eight, the last point is to take notice 
of your circumstances. Point eight, take notice of your circumstances. And so in this one, we find that although every open door before you is not God's plan, which means that there is going to be doors that open before you, but they're not necessarily God's plan for you. But he does open and he does close doors. This is a knowledge point for you. God does open and close doors. So sometimes things may hurt you in life and you think, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening to me. But if you see God's hand on it, sometimes you have to close the door in your face to, for you to change direction and do what you should be doing. At first you may be devastated and think, oh yeah, but hang on. But then later on you realise in hindsight that it was actually the best thing for you. It's hard at the time sometimes. A good example, if you're five foot six tall and you weigh 50 kilograms, then you're probably not called to play, play a professional contact sport. Right? So sometimes we may envision ourselves as something that we're not. We want to do something that's not for us. And if we do do it, we're going to get slammed. And so we have to have some wisdom, we have to have a look at ourselves, and we have to uh, be realistic about our identity, our identity in Christ, who we actually are. And we need to pursue things from that point of view. So in conclusion today, we need to embrace the adventure of our race, the Lord that has set for each of us. It will require effort, perseverance and endurance to fix your eyes on Jesus and stay the course. As we, sp as we spoke about, there will be hindrances and there will be sin. And we're going to talk about in the future... Uh, sermons about obstacles and what they look like because God, like I'm talking about here with the doors, will actually place obstacles in front of you in order to change your direction when you're not listening to Him. So it's part of our journey. So take time in the upcoming week to pray and to ask God if you haven't already done this, take this seriously. Take time in the upcoming week to pray and ask God for His plan and His will in your life. If you find that you're floundering along and you're not sure what it is, write down those questions, pray to the Lord. As I said, kindly, shut up, listen, and then journal what he says to you. Take notice of what he says to you. And when you come away from that, you may be surprised at what you hear. And then go on the path, go on the journey that he's set for you, and you'll find that your life will change. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today's sermon. So we're just going to close our eyes and bow our heads uh, in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you know each of us personally. You know our gifts and abilities and have set a plan and a course for each of our lives. We pray for obedience to your will to run life's race well in a way that is pleasing to you, Lord. We pray for strength to overcome the sin and hindrances that come our way to entangle us. Lord, we lift up our community of people, our church, that we may journey well together as a family and lift each other up when we stumble and fall. We pray to be bold and intentional in all that we do. Thank you for all that you do in our lives, for your love and your compassion. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, well thank you to those who have been watching uh, online. We're going to uh, bid you good night at this stage. I pray you've enjoyed uh, today's sermon. This is the first of five uh, sermons. Uh, so next week uh, we'll be back with the uh, second sermon. So stay safe and God bless. <laughs>